Right. Um, that's a wild <laughs> overhang there. I'm not sure the point of that is. But anyway, okay, so um, there's that truss. And if we zoom in on it, the thing that I, that I think is cool about this in terms of what we've been talking about is it's obviously, it's a complex um, assembly, right? It's, it's rounded. Um, it's holding up a, a real world highway. So whatever the requirements were for that is what the trust had to, to accommodate. But then you can see that it's definitely separated in, into modules that are, I mean, straight up, you know, boring, uh, uh, you know, example from a page we can find, you know, in the slides of a, um, a, a named trust, right? Um, so then if we, let me, uh, they just changed this whole interface. So I actually had it open and then I had to close it and then I opened it up again five minutes later and it was a completely different interface. So I'm kind of still getting used to it. Let me bring in that picture. So I want to kind of go back even, and this, maybe this isn't quiz material, but I think that the point of like the way that, you know, you, you, I am going to word these questions is they're not going to be, they're, okay, it's 20 multiple choice, multiple choice questions, 20 minutes. So you don't have a lot of time with these questions uh, because it's no calculations. Um, and like I said, they'll, and they'll be, they'll be, uh, their, their order will be random. Um, okay. So the first point I want to make is that let me do it with this guy. This is clearly sorry, close that. This is a module. And by the way, I don't know this is something that you guys do a lot. It, you're, you're not designing modulars, you're designing modelers. Just, I mean, I don't know why you guys get, I get that a lot, modular. Modular house is like a house that's made up of modules, right? Or it's a system. Um, okay, so this is this, this, this assembly that's out of this larger thing. Um, and I want to make the point that if you, if you uh, sort of do this for a while, you will start seeing patterns that make sense. Um, so if, for example, you know, here's our two, you know, and actually if you go in there and look at that, I mean, that, that's an actual roller joint. Um, I have a close-up of it, or you can go just, uh, well, actually, I'd have to show it to you. Um, so this is sort of directly connected to everything we've been talking about. And if you think about it, so it's supported, um, you know, here and here. And this is essentially then a beam. And you can look at it like that, you know, that there's a load coming down. And so um, you can, you can, uh, sort of theorize how it's going to uh, take these loads as a general shape. Don't use the word shape on your, unless it's really specific in, in your uh, reports. It's kind of hard to avoid it, but because um, it's not the shape that's making the, that, that's making this strong or weak. It's the individual members, but we can see patterns. And so I'm going to posit that this is like an arch and this is like an arch and that those are, since this is statics, what's statics? Good qu quiz question. Yeah. Equilibrium not moving. Okay. Yeah, that's it. So it's um, it's this it, it's uh, design based on um, assemblies or you know uh, assemblies or members that are designed to either um, you can say to not move or move in a predictable way, right? And um, when they do move out of that predictable way, they're going to fail and you're going to predict that, right? And the whole idea behind it though is that you're it's static because you have, you're designing something that for every action, there's uh, a reaction that keeps it in the shape it's in, right? So since this is, we, we're, we know this is designed to be static, then we're saying, okay, then I bet you then, then those arcs are countermanded by these arcs. And now that's not something that's on the quiz. That's not something that you need to be thinking about in terms of your trusses necessarily. But the point is that I made, I've made a bunch of times in this class that our theory does not come from somebody sitting down, you know, cracking their knuckles and sitting with a calculator or um, just abstractly doing math. It's always been 
this connection between experience uh, and calculation and that that almost all well in, in something like structures where there's a clear physical um, thing that you're dealing with there's going to be some conceptual way to understand the math so like when we're looking at Euler's equation we can go yeah why is the in condition in the denominator you know there's a reason for that that makes sense it's not just like some weird um, abstract calculation right so then if I were to then simplify this in the way that, for example, we're, I'm going to go all the way back to get rid of all these because I think these are, this box is confusing. Um, it might look like this. Start with the And then I'm thinking, okay, if that's if that's that arc going up there, then that's compression. And I'm thinking this is probably tension. And if we go to, I think I've still got it open from yesterday. It's a different one. If we actually build this truss, sorry, this thing is on this computer, does not fit completely on the, uh, the screen. But um, we see that that's, that's exactly what the map tells us is happening, right? And so my point is that there's not, you know, it is math, it is triangles, but there is a conceptual framework for this. Um, and that's where we started, was with people building things without the math for a long period of time. But what I've been doing all semester is saying, okay, we start with the, you know, trust in the wild, but let's just focus on, you know, one triangle. And so let's do that again and, and kind of recreate simple planar trust theory. And this quiz is, you know, it's trust theory quiz. It's simple planar trust theory. So that's, you know, what we're doing. Um, and so the whole idea behind that we've been talking about since the beginning of the semester is that simple planar trust theory, well, the performance of trusses, let me try to get this a little more accurate, um, is a relationship between geometry and materials, right? Uh, and the trust theory is only talking about the geometry. But the idea is that, oh, let me actually move this down a little bit away from the picture. What we're trying to figure out with our theory is if we load this truss, how is this truss going to respond and can we predict how it's going to fail and even what load it's going to fail at? That's the whole idea behind the trust theory. So if we use our, um, so okay, so the, the, the question is how do we then get from this layout to something where we can, we can quantify failure loads? we have to deal with something called simple planar trust theory. And here's the basics of it that we've been talking about all semester, but the summary. If we imagine this cube as, you know, the universe within which our trust is being built, the first thing we have to do is say we're going to constrain that trust to a plane within that universe. So that's the planar part. And why do we do that? Because um, we know from our, what we're going to get into in a second, our, our um, study of materials, that if we can say that we're constraining the load to the centroid, the center axis of a member, that um, we can figure out what's going on in that member in terms of, of stress and strain and uh, buckling loads or, or uh, failure loads and tension or buckling. Um, because this is math and that those lines have no volume. They're one point thick. So there's no place for that load to go except through the center of whatever member we're going to build in the real world. Okay? That's why it's called planar. Um, that's why we're constraining it to a plane. So we have our, and then of course we're talking about a, it's, it's complicated as we want to get. As far as triangles, um, we can, it's the same concept, right? I just keep it. And, and by the way, I would suggest when you're, when you're messing around with your, with your, um, your modelers, 
Start with, not this simple, but start with simple triangles. I mean, just trust geometries to test your modeler, right? You get some crazy huge thing, it's harder to, and then change a little bit, something small in it. It's harder to tell if it's working or not. So, I, and, and why spend all that work? I mean, you, you, basically your modeler is going to function the same for any geometry. Um, so get it working with something simple so it's, it's easy to, to test, go back and forth. Anyway, um, so in addition then to be, being constrained in that plane, it has to be constrained somehow. You know, this, this dimension has to be known. So we have to have an XY constraint and then a, um, well, actually, we have to constrain it in the plane and then how, basically how far it is up in the plane, which means we have to attach it to something, which is the Earth. That's what we're on. We're always going to attach it to the Earth. So that's what, you know, we're, that's the other thing we need to do. And so we have to have some kind of connection like these, you know, that we always draw. And then, then we make them a specific type of connection for a reason that comes later. So that's the planar part. The simple is that... Uh, we make we make our truss of triangles, and we have uh, a center axis, and it's symmetrical about that axis. Now, why would that be true? We've we've said a number of times that the trusses are about spanning space, and you're either trying to get across that space or block stuff from coming across it, but you're still spanning the space. Well, actually, with trusses, you're only trying to get across it. Really, you're not blocking anything with a truss. That's why we make them really light, as light as we can, which is why we're using triangles because triangles are a very efficient way of um, creating structure, but if I think the best way to understand the simple part is, so let's say we're spanning space. There's going to be a center to that, that span. And we make this truss, this side of the truss, that's not really going to do anything. But let's just pretend like that's going to make it stronger. Or we, we, we do something to that side of the truss, and then we do something different over here. What's that going to accomplish? Well, if one side is stronger than the other, the weaker side is going to fail. So we did nothing right by making it asymmetrical now of course in the real world there might be tons of reasons why you'd make it as asymmetrical that's why you go out you know you get it, go out of simple theory and you're going to see things that are um counter to that um and if any, i don't know if any of you guys are musicians like you know like let's say you learn jazz jazz is if you go to like a junior high jazz concert it's the worst thing you'll ever hear because they've just learned these little rules and they're like you know and it just looks it sounds like like robots playing music right but then the whole point of it is that then you internalize those rules and then you get to where you're, you're being creative with it, right? And you know, you're like, the color blue, and you create blue in, 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 the, in the form of jazz. If you just said blue and you started making noise, it's not going to be within any kind of context, whatever. I'm saying, so you, the rules are meant to be broken, but you have to understand them really well, right? Um, and so we're just talking about the rules in this class. We're not really talking about breaking them. Uh, okay, so that's, that's, the, uh, that's the simple part. And the way we met, so how do we mathematically, that might be something on the quiz, how do we mathematically define that, that relationship, that simple relationship? No? Nobody remembers members equals two times joints minus three? Right? And the reason, you know, that is not, again, some weird, strange calculus number. It's just saying if we go, okay, I'm going to add a joint and a joint and two members on each side, that's gonna, that's gonna make that equation work, right? So it's just, that's as simple as that. And the reason I wanna, I, I wanna bring that up again is because the way in your trust analyzer not to um, get the no trust designation is by going systematically. You start with a geometry and then you add triangles to each side. If you wanna add two triangles, fine, but be conscious that you're adding triangles, right? Um, don't just start like crazily making something um, because you're, you're going you're gonna to lose that, that equation, but also you're going to lose the point of why you're doing it, right? Because you're always, you're adding triangles for some reason, which is, you know, for example, if I were trying to make this stronger, this simple truss that we've drawn a thousand times, you know, and I've always drawn this, I go, okay, well, I'm going to make, if this is the failing member right here, if I know that this is the failing member, if I cut it in half because of what we know about buckling, I'm going to make that truss a lot stronger, right? So it's not anything about the shape. We don't say now, I mean, uh, oh, now I can see an arch in there. No, it's that we actually, we just simply made the failing member stronger by making it shorter because it's going to fail in buckling because it was in compression, right? That's the thought process. It has to be in your iterations in your projects. All right, so that's the simple. And, you know, any of those things, like that, that would be a, an, oops, 
let me just I, I'll just leave it as it is. It can be it can be this more complex. Or actually, I'll try to. It's one thing I think they've done is they. Oh yeah, that's kind of cool. I don't necessarily like it. They make it to where you're you're only erasing you're erasing in full like a full line as opposed to just like an actual eraser. Um, so I might say, why do we only use triangles, or why do we have a symmetrical? Um, why is a simple planar truss symmetrical? And you'd say, because you know, making one side stronger isn't going to, the other side's going to fail, so what's the difference? That's going to be in, uh, I mean, then, so you're not being uh, efficient in your design, and that's kind of the whole point, right? Of, or that's a baseline goal in engineering, is to be efficient. Okay, so we've got simple and planar. What else do we need? Um, well, I think we're now, we're ready to start conceptualizing how this, um, like, Maybe this is the next thing to say. Why triangles? So we've got this thing. It's it's lot. It's not going to fall over, right? So that, that's why it's in a plane. If it just if, if we don't have it like artificially uh, in, uh, enshrined in this plane, it, it could fall over, and then we're we're outside of our theory because we got to keep it going. Th the loads going through the centroid. So let's go back to our drawing up here. I mean, our picture. You can see that there's tons. Of, so here, like we already said, this is our. This is our truss. Now maybe you're going to say, okay, the, these these members in the, in the uh, maybe this is our truss too, maybe maybe not. We could argue it either way, but definitely this is not our truss. What's going on with this? Why are these? So these are at right angles to the truss. These other triangles. What are they doing? Yeah. Yeah, so they're they're there to support the truss so that it doesn't fall over, so it stays in a plane, right? So we have so clearly a simple planar truss geometry here, but then to actually make it in the real world is all a bunch of a bunch of other stuff we have to do, right? Um, and you know this 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 goes back to here, and there's some stuff like that, and then there's there's a there's another like column back here, like a big beam. So there's a bunch of other stuff going on to allow us. To, to keep that truss within a plane, right? So that's something you always gotta remember back and forth between theory. Theory is always, it's so dangerous theory if you don't put it in context, you don't use your brain. And a lot of times you guys don't use your brains in these classes, I've noticed, right? Because you're on autopilot. Um, because another thing, by the way, like I mentioned last time, because you're just, I know, I get it. You're like, what do I have to do now? What are those you know, people told me I have to do today? Okay, I'll do it. Tell me exactly what it is, I'll do it. Don't get in that mode because then you, once you get out of here, no one cares. No, no one wants to tell you what to do. They want you to do stuff that they don't know how to do, right? Or that they are like, I don't know. You figure this out. Um, okay. Um, so if we we conceive of this load here moving through this, it's gonna. It's obviously since it's just a. It's in a plane. It's gonna come down through here, right? Through that member. So if it, if this is statics we know that this member has to push back. So it's going to be pushing back against that load. What's that called? What's, a, um, what's going on here to this member? Come on, you guys. Yeah. True. But what's, what's the, uh, what's the um, what kind of stress is it under? Yeah. Actually, it's under compression, but but at least you're in, in the right because we're so we're so what is compression? Compressing, pushing, squeezing. So it's being squeezed, you know, because it, it's it's held in these two joints. There, there, there's a, a load coming down on it, so it's being compressed. Now, don't be embarrassed by not knowing that, but this is like, you know, this is like the there's compression, tension, and shear. So you've really got to get these basics, and, and be able to do this kind of simple, you know, thinking through it. Okay, so the whole point is, this is being, so we're, we're pushing down on the top of those two members, they're being squeezed, um, and now by being squeezed, this load wants to come out down here, but it's not going to because of this member pulling back. So that's intention. So this, it's being pulled out on, right? This is, this is trying to go out, so that member is having to pull it back. We know it's pulling back, why? We're in statics, right? It has to be pulling back because this isn't this. We are we are saying that this is going to be in equilibrium. It's going to be static 
So if one, if one member is pushing out, the other's got to be pulling back. And the advantage to this whole, this whole thing, this, this triangle deal, is that it's, it's a very self-supporting geometry. Geometry, right? It's not anything else. And so if, I, if I'm over here and I have this instead, you know, which I drew a bunch of times in the initial, and maybe if I load it directly here, it's just going to be act like a column. But if I have a load coming this way, it's going to pretty much immediately just fall over unless it, except for unless this joint right here is really strong. It's all going to be about the joint in that configuration. But if we have a triangle doing that and we load it this way, it's going to push back like that. This is going to pull this way and it's going to be, um, it's going to be internally consistent. Uh, it, it has a chance of being statically uh, in equilibrium. So, from here then, how do we get, so we get it, okay, that's basically, we could take this logic and if we were like savants, we could look at sort of any ge geometry and go, oh yeah, I see how it's going together and that's going to be, this. these are in compression, those are in tension. Um, but we're going, to do, we're going to do it with math, so we don't need to do that. Um, but we want them, but, but now we, we, we need actual numbers, right? Without, just, just a, con in the past, that would have been enough and they said, okay, now I kind of get that, you know, I, um, and they might even said, you know, I know that things are going to be stronger in compression, so I, mean, I just need to make, you know, make that bigger. Or they, they would have some, some conceptual way of deal, dealing with it. But we want to make this math. So we want to go from, from this. We know this is in compression. And we know this is in tension. Oops. Like it irritates me. I cannot move this toolbar, apparently. I, I like it on the side. Um, we want to go from that to numbers. To do that, we need another layer here, which is um, somebody noticed, oh wait, these are triangles. And, oh yeah, and that guy Newton did like the force parallelogram. We can, we can look at forces um, as geometry, as, vect as force vectors. So let's just then apply that force vector thing to triangles that are in a truss, and we'll be able to figure out um, not only which are um, which are in compression and tension, but which ones are failing, or, or which what their, their load ratios are basically is how we're approaching it. And the way we can do that, how we how we access the trig is we say, okay, we know it's static. So if we have um, the sum of forces um, in the x direction is going to equal zero because it's static. The sum of forces in the y direction is going to equal zero because it's static. And the sum of moments about any axis, sorry, x y is going to equal zero. So that means, if I, let me just draw this again over here. We're saying if we then call these specific types of joints, like this is a hinged and this is a, a roller, a hinge joint is going to have a reaction, um, we're going to call this A and this B. It's going to have a reaction uh, in the y direction. B is going to have a, a reaction in the y direction. And um, A is going to have a reaction in the x direction, right? So we can plug those into here. And then A, for example, if, if we then are loading this here, A is going to also be rotating. And that's the moment. So we can plug that into here. So some of moments about A. So if we have then three, well, and why three? Why do we pick hinge and roller? Because we have um, three unknowns. <laughs> we have three unknowns, and if we have three reactions, then we can then we can um, solve those equations. We didn't really cover that in this class. What happened? Did that? Oh, maybe you, I think you guys turned off. The the power for that is over there. Yeah, yeah. No, it's. I know that because it happens all the time. <laughs> That's how I know. Um, so hold on a sec. You may have to like can you hit that button until it's green. Just push it once. Yeah, that now it's going to start up again. Um, so we have. Three unknowns and the three reactions, and then we then we can solve those um, equations, which you guys have done in, in Mech Solids, right? 
and then that way we can get if we know the the, the base and the height of the tr of the uh, of the truss, we can get the um, we can get the angles, and then we can then we can apply the, the sine and cosine, um, do, 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 uh, and and solve for and get actual numbers. So that's what we're going to do next as soon as this shows up. But by the way, so what are we so we said at the beginning of this summary that. Um, Trusses are a relationship between geometry and materials. And the relationship basically is how do they perform? So how strong or weak are they? How heavy are or light are they um, given a certain geometry and a certain man, is that gonna okay good. Um, certain geometry and a certain um, uh, material. And well, the geometry is both the shape of the truss or the, the triangles in the truss and then the uh, cross section of the materials, which we're gonna, we'll get to in a second. Do, 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 do. Okay, I think it's about to come on. Maybe I'm not connected now. There we go. All right. So we're about to come to the end of the, of, of the useful or, or the, what we can do with the geometry alone. But with all this, with the trig now, we can actually, and if we know that, um, you know, this is 15 units wide. I use, always use this because that's what was in the, uh, our truss buster was this size, 15 inches by four. And so I always just remember what the, the, the answer for this simple triangle is for that. So that's why I always use those dimensions. There's not, nothing magical there. It comes out that this is, if we load this with one pound, This is going to, the, the members in compression are going to experience 1.06 pounds or something like that. And the members in tension are going to experience something like 94 pounds. So now we have, um, this is incredible. Just with math and numbers, I mean, <laughs> math is numbers, just with math, um, nothing else, we can get to the point where we can say any set of symmetrical triangles you give me, we can calculate what the relative loads are in each member, okay? And whether or not they're gonna be in compression or tension. That's incredible, that's great, but there's nothing we can actually do with that um, in the real world because we don't know what those members are failing at. So if it's made out of marshmallows or it's made out of steel, um, if the members have different um, uh, cross-sectional areas and different shapes, different forms, then we'll have different uh, failure loads. And that's what we're trying to get to is, is failure load and strength to weight, right? So how do we do that then? What, what's our next step? Well, we know that, um, that the, oh, and actually there's one more thing we gotta talk about before I move on. Um, we also don't know anything about the joints. So just, we gotta remember to, to talk about that briefly. But, so what we know is that, um, Every member is going to either be in pure compression or tension. So a member can't be in compression and tension at the same time, right? And they're, that's why they're called two force members. I find that a little bit confusing because it's really not two forces. It's one force, but there's two different forces it could be. So if you look up simple trainer, planar trust theory, could be on a quiz. They're called two force members for that reason. Um, the only thing we, need, we know about joints in... Uh, the theory, the simple planar trust theory, is that they're infinitely small. And how strong are the joints? Say again? Indestructible. They're infinitely strong. Which, of course, is stupid. But, I mean, that's, that's conceptual, right? And what, the, what does that tell us then, once we get into the physical world of trusses, that when we're designing joints, if we want to use simple planar trust theory to predict what a truss is going to fail at, what do we have to make sure the joints can do? Yeah. Yeah, they have to be they have to be infinitely strong in the universe of our trust. They have to, be able to withstand the maximum load um, that that any that we can imagine that, that they might experience in the particular geometry of the trust we're designing. Okay, so we've we've taken the geometry as far as we can as far as simple planar trust theory. So then we said, okay, well let's just go figure out how um, tension, compression, and shear work. Oh, because. We're gonna the, we're gonna have to have some theories to how the joints fail, and we ended up th thinking that was shear. Um, so let's just go over that uh, that universe. So we said 
we started with tension. And we said if we have a member in tension, that means we're pulling on it. First of all, we always know that there's going to be, uh, 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 we're in static, so it's going to be, a, uh, that for every action, there's going to be a, a reaction that keeps our um, system static. If we draw that in axonometric view, we get this. And since we know from simple planar trust theory that we're going to be going through the centroid of our member because there's nothing else in a centroid in a, in a planar truss, we can, set, we can then use other things we know about tension that um, we just said is true here. They make complete sense. But of course, there's a whole history of how this got developed too. But the idea is that if we're loading through the centroid of this member in tension, um, then the, we can assume that the load is being taken by the cross section of the member. So this load is normal. That would be definitely a question that could be on the quiz. It's normal to uh, the material as opposed to parallel, which is what it's going to be in shear. Um, so that load is being distributed through here. This is called stress. And it's the internal response to loading. What's a load? Applied force. force. Perfect. Yes, thank you. Um, and you'll often see um, what, I, what I'm calling loads be called forces. Um, I don't think that's really accurate, but um, we call them, we call uh, loads in this class applied forces. Uh, and then we had an equation for it. What's the equation for this? Yeah. Yes. And now, I don't expect you to remember, you really should be able to remember the um, Johnson's parabola equation, but I expect you to remember this one. I mean, come on. Um, and it's very powerful. So that's the internal response. Now we have, we have another response. So if I'm over here, let's draw this guy again. Actually, I should draw him or her, it, they. A little bit larger to make a point. And I'm pulling on it. What's going to happen? It's going to, what do we call that? What's that difference in length? Yeah. Uh, deformation. Deformation. Uh, I think that would technically be, be that this is a type of deformation, but we call it displacement. Okay, so that's displacement. Um, delta L is displacement. Now, uh, let me go back to stress for a second. And we understand, right, that this is, I mean, yeah, that this is, the theory is that every single cross section then is taking that load, right? So does the length of the membrane tension matter? Okay, and for that reason, right? And also for this reason, there's no length in that equation, right? So again, like that's a, that's definitely going to be in the quiz, something about that. But also just um, when you go, for example, in your modelers right now, some of you guys have, um, you're, you're figuring out the failure loads for your, for your members, but all the ones that are positive, you're not, you're not thinking about what the, what they're actually what what is their the equation that we apply to them. You're using buckling equations for members that are positive, which are going to be members in tension, right? So that we have to use this equation for members in tension. So if we're well, maybe I'll just maybe ask me that if I don't if I don't bring it up again because that's that's important. Um, and, and if you're not getting that at this point, um, you need that you need to have that in your in your modelers. I'm pretty sure even in Shapanko's you're going to be using that. Um, Okay, and so this is called strain. It's the external response, right? Totally makes sense, right? Because we're seeing it, it's stretching up, it's external. What's happening though, if we pull it up, what's happening to the, to the, to the cross-sectional area as we stretch it? It's reducing, right? Because it's, it's, a, it's not magic, it's a set volume. Um, and that's gonna be, that's an important, I'm not sure if I, 
I'm, but I'm mentioning it to you today so I can add it on the quiz if I want to. Um, that's going to cause something, uh, create two different terms. We're going to have we're going to have engineering strain and working strain, or engineering stress and working stress. Um, okay, so and our equation for this, what's the equation for strain and tension? Come on, it's change in length over length. Did you guys really not know that? Or are you just being shy today? It's Friday or something like that. That kind of would surprise me if you wouldn't know that. Because um, we've just used it so many times, but whatever. Um, okay, so the, so what we've done with the, the, the way that we typically, and it, all we did with this in this class was we then plotted stress over strain for a material. And we got some kind of graph like this. So first of all, stress, strain, all these things, are they, is this geometry? Or is this about materials? Materials, right? This is, these are material properties. That's very important. Now, of course, there is geometry involved because we have cross-section. Um, we already said length doesn't matter. But the cross-section, we change it, we're changing it for everything, right? We're not, we're, it's not like it's changing um, as part of the, the study here, right? So we have then uh, stress over strain. Our units have always been PSI, and usually we're, we're doing this as percent. It's inches over inches, which is, we can then say it's, we can display it as percent. All right. What then, what do we call this section of the graph, of the, of the data set? Yeah. It's elastic region, right? Elastic region, some you might actually say is this, but that's yeah. It's it's the the elastic region is the region where the um, portion of your data curve is a line or close to a line, and that's because it's proportional. In other words, as you increase the force, you're going to increase the stress and you're going to increase the strain proportionally, right? And that's really, then that's the strength of that material. It's often called the strength or, the, or it's, uh, um, yeah, I think people often say that's the strength of the material. It's also a material that has this shape of its stress strain diagram. It's called brittle because it's, it can be very, this could be super steep. So it's, it can be really strong, but if it breaks instantaneously, that can be, that can be bad for structural applications because then you have a catastrophic break with no warning and people die, right? So typically you'll see, you know, if you're analyzing materials or systems that are in structures, it'll be more like this one that we've got here. This is called ductile because it's it's adjusting. It has a long plastic region. Um, so brittle and ductile, I, I, they're in the slides that I never, by the way, there, there are slides that um, we had a really good, great TA who's, who's a structural engineering PhD student who did the slides last year. Those are what are posted. I've never gone over them because it's the same stuff I'm talking about all the time. But if you want to see a different way that they're um, presented in slides, you can go there. Um, okay. So ductile brittle. What is... So we actually measure that... Um, we measure... Okay, well, actually, let me put it this way. What is the name of that, of the slope of that line? That would be a really good question. Young's modulus? Yeah, it's the Young's modulus or the modulus elasticity. Young's modulus, because some guy named Young uh, was involved in it. Modulus elasticity makes more sense, right? It's descriptive. Um, we measure that between point... Um, 0.005 and 0.0025 strain, which is 0.05% and 0.25% strain. Why would we do that? Why would we measure it right at the beginning of when we're, when we're testing uh, a material? Yeah. That's a, that's a good answer. He said if it's linear, it's going to be the same, so might as well do it there. But 
there's another reason. Think about it. As we start pulling on this and we're applying stre uh, stress, it's going to strain, which means it's going to pull up. It's going to get longer, which we already said means that the cross-sectional area is going to get less. What does that mean then? Is, it, is this really a line? Because as, as it gets thinner, look at what does our, um, our stress uh, equation tell us? If we have a lower, a smaller cross-sectional area, is it getting stronger or weaker? It's getting weaker. The stress is getting higher, right? By the way, stress and strain, they're really, they're, they're, I mean, uh, stress and strength are flip sides. The strength of something is how much stress it can take. So it's the same number, okay? So w when we say that the, you know, the, the stress of a truss, the, the, the strength of a truss is how much stress it can take, which we, we're, we're considering in terms of load. So the point is that we do this right at the beginning because that's before we've, we've done any, that, that's like it's pure form, this material. Um, and as we get, we go further, even though we have a, a more portion of this that we call linear, it's not really linear, right? So we always have in engineering, there's, there's always going to be something like this. Um, and this is, at, oops, this is in a, uh, a standard, an ASTM standard. I keep doing that. Just kidding. Okay. Um, and so the reason that we do it, so we have to look up the standard, we have to measure it. Uh, and I think in Europe and in the U.S. there's different standards. But it's so that when, when we're testing these things, that, that we're, we're comparing apples to apples, right? So if you're buying this material from somebody and they've, they've tested it to all the SDM standards, you can say, this is, I can assume this is how it's going gonna, it's gonna to perform. And if I buy it from somebody else who did it, who's claiming the same thing, you ought to be able to assume the same performance, even if it's from completely different manufacturers. That's the idea behind it, okay? And this then was what I was saying. We have now then an engineering and a working stress because the working stress is the one that's changing. The engineering one is our theoretical. Does that make sense? Okay. Now let's just go back to our chart and name all the stuff that we should know from here. So we already said that this is the, this is E, the slope of this line. Um, what is this point right here? Yeah. Yield strength, right? So is this, but the yield strength then, is that the X or the Y value at that point? The X value is the strain. So it's the Y value. That's really important to, to understand and think about. So when we say the yield stress, we're talking about the Y value of that point, right? Um, so when we're at, I guess I, maybe I should just, I'm doing stream of consciousness, so some of this is maybe a little bit out of, well, no, I'll wait on it. No, I won't. Um, so if we were trying to say, if this were actually a material that we were testing and um, we wanted to know the load, um, the load it experiences at yield, that would be called a load at yield, right? And we'd be able to, how would we calculate that? What, so what's so stress equals load over cross-sectional area, right? So if this is yield, then the load at yield is going to be load at yield equals stress times area, okay? This is the equation you're using in your modeler for members failing in tension, right? They're not failing in buckling, they're failing in tension. And we're just, I'm just telling you this. Typically, we're going to use the, the load at yield because in structures, you don't, if you go past the, the yield point, you've damaged the material. It's still going to survive maybe, but now you've got a new material and it's not going to fit whatever you've designed. Okay, so structures is all about, and I'm simplifying here, this is not jazz yet, um, we're, we're staying below the yield point in structures. And there's two different, there's different methods for calculating um, expected or, or, or design loads. Um, they're, and they're, if you go look them up, they're both about a percentage below yield. Okay, so that's the yield stress or yield strength or load at yield or strain at yield. That's just, that's where we are, um, what's happening after that point. If we keep uh, applying a, a load, a higher load to this specimen, what happens after that in this section here? It's the plastic region, right, thanks. It's plastic region means that it's not gonna pop back when we, we, we let go of the force. 
So it's been it's molecularly changed. It's it's permanently damaged. So this is why this is also called. So it's called the yield, stress, strain, load, whatever. It's also called proportional limit. Because that's the limit of where this is going to this material is going to respond proportionally to a load. Okay. What's this point? No? Yeah. Ultimate tensile strength. Thank you. What what is the ultimate tensile strength? It's the it's yeah. Yeah, the and so tensile strain, so it's a, it's the maximum strain it'll take, or stress if it's the ultimate tensile strength, ultimate that's not actually it's ultimate tensile strength usually, so it's the mass max stress it will take. Um, but we can also calculate a load there. Um, and that means that, so what's happening in this graph is that um, after we, we've damaged the material and start re rearranging it molecularly, it's still going to be able to take more load. It's always going to be that this portion of the graph has got a lower slope than our unadulterated uh, material. Um, but at some point, it's, it's maxed out. It gets to the ultimate tensile strength. And then after that, it's quickly going to drop down to this point. What's, what's this point? Break point, fracture point, stress at fracture, percent elongation at fracture. That's what that's what we call this. The X um, value is typically called the percent elongation at fracture. Those are all things that could be on the quiz. Okay, so those are the basic. That's the basic information that we get from a stress strain diagram. It's all about material properties. Once we've done this and we've created a world where we know this stuff, we can now look up um, published values for any material that's been tested. And if we don't have the ability to test things ourselves, uh, we can purchase something and, and, they, and they told us, we designed this to the, this following ASTM standard. And we're telling you it has this range of yield strengths or whatever. And then we design based on that, okay? material properties and then whenever we buy that material from that company we're not, we're not like going and calculating it we're not testing it we use that those those values okay so that's tensile strength that's tension that's how we're going to deal with these uh anything that's in tension in our trust right and i can tell this is you know and this is long i'm sorry but i i mean and, and i've recorded it so you can go back and scroll through things that maybe you didn't understand or remember but I can, I can see it's worthwhile because you guys are not completely, you know, it, it's good. We go back, we kind of did the whole thing. Now we're just saying it, saying it again. You've really got to try to pull this together now and understand because it should be that you're, when you're in your, when you're in your modeler, and by the way, I'm, I'm not dissing you. I mean, the whole, to me, when I, when I think about your semester right now, you got, you got differential equations and you got, you know, multiplication and division in here. Why are we doing this? Well, for one thing, it's a bunch of different variables, right? It's a, it's a fairly complicated modeler, even though it's just as simple as possible math, right? Um, and it becomes difficult to keep track of. And it becomes difficult to remember, you know, you're supposed to conceptually understand what you're doing. The modeler is just there to, to, to uh, turn you into a genius and be able to, because, you know, there really are people who can look at it and go, oh, that's, that, that's what these things are failing at because they have these amazing brains that can do all these calculations themselves. I'm nowhere near that, so I need a modeler. But I understand, I need to understand what it's doing in order for it to have any value, right? Um, so that's what you're, all, you know, in your modelers, you should be understanding what you're doing. Okay, so now we understand tension well enough uh, to design, to know how to, how to calculate failure loads for members in... Um, Intention. So, how are we going to do it in buckling? Well, so we said, and I'm should I go over to? No, I'll do this here first. Okay, the idea is that in in uh, well compression. I'm sorry, not buckling. For um, what we called short fat, I mean that's literally what you call them often in um, structures. Short fat members that are in, under compression, they respond the same way as, as if they were in pure tension. The length of the, of the member doesn't matter. Stress, uh, let's say in compression, equals load over cross-sectional area. We, can, we think that this, we, we can conceive of this the same way, that this is taking the load, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Okay? It's got to be, so think about, you know, a washer, okay? 
I'm, I'm talking about like a washer that's on a, you know, that, that's underneath a bolt head. That's going to be experienced pure compression, you know, and it's not really going to be an issue for you. You're not going to think that that bolt is going to, that, that washer is going to compress. You're thinking it's going to, maybe it's going to uh, break in some other way like shear. It's pretty, it's going to be pretty strong in compression, just like it would be in tension if you pulled on it, right? So that's straightforward. But then we said, okay, well, what if we get like a really long, thin, it's the same material, and we're compressing it. What's going to happen to that? And we, and we call these long slender or long thin. That's not going to compress. What's, that, what's going to happen to that? Buckle. Thank you. I know, I mean, some of you guys are like, oh my God, do I have to really say it? But yeah, it would go faster if you just yell out things that are obvious. So this is going to buckle. So the first thing to notice about buckling is it's a failure mode. I mean, it's a catastrophic failure mode because once we get, the whole idea is that we're, we're in plane right here, right? We're going through the centroid. When we start to buckle, our, our cross section, right, if we're like this, our cross section is no longer in the plane of that force, right? So it's going to fail really quickly because it's not, it's, it's a whole different, you know, uh, ball of wax or whatever you want to call it. So we need a, a new equation for this, right? And so here, along came Euler, uh, and we've been calling it the, so it's called the critical, Euler's critical buckling load equation. So we've been saying Euler PCR, P is load, CR, critical, critical buckling load. And this is what he came up with. Now this is starting to slow down like I did yesterday, I don't know why it's doing that. And then we spent a lot of time on this and we dissected it. So we don't really need to, we don't know, need to know anything about pi. It's a constant. Um, there, there's some kind of circle in here somewhere. Um, where are we getting E from? Yes. So where exactly, where, where, where do we, what is that related to? Is it, a, is it a geometric property? It's material. So we have to know the material of the column or the beam or the, the member before we can use Euler's critical buckling load equation, right? That to to ties us right back to the beginning where we're talking about geometry and materials. We're now talking about materials and geometry together. And we were talking about some geometry here, like I said, because we had area and tension. We're just not changing it. It's constant during our experiment, so it's not really, it's not a factor, right? Um, we determine it. Um, okay, what's KT? In conditions, have you said? In condition, constant, or, or coefficient. Where does it come from? The ends, right? Condition. What, um, but let's, I think we need to talk about that a little bit. Here's the typical way we draw it. We've got three columns. You know, maybe this is this is some kind of beam up here. This is conceptual, right? This is a little slab down here. We can have a hinged, fixed, maybe, you know, there's tons of, there's other options. There can be a free um, or a hinge fixed. H, H, F, F, H, F. What is the KT value for a hinge hinged? Definitely going to be on the quiz. One. What is it for a fixed fix? Point five. And for hinge fixes, point six six seven or something like that. Whatever. Why? What? Why are these numbers? What do they mean? That, again, it's not some bizarre calculus here. This is what it's about. In a hinge connection. Yeah, the, the entire member is exposed to, the, to the, the load. So in our case, it's exposed to buckling. Hence, one. Okay, it's a full length. The, um, for fixed fixed, it's more like this. And then for hinge fixed, it would be like this. Now, what, what, what's going on here? Why does that matter? Well, so we're saying this is, what's, what's the LU? Definitely quiz material. 
LU, unsupported, unsupported, um, unsupported length, right? So what does that mean? This means the, the length of the member that you're talking about that's not supported by something, so it's going to expose to the load, right? In this case, to the buckling load. So what we're saying in this way, exaggerated drawing, is that this is the LU for that fixed fixed connection, right? So it's not the strength of the connection that we're talking about. So it's not. It's an in condition, not a strength of a. It's not like how strong the bolt is. It's what that connection does to the beam, right? So this shortened our LU, and so if we come over here in our Eulers. What's, what, would, what would a shortened KT do to our, the strength of our member? So make it stronger. It's going gonna, it's gonna, it's gonna to raise the critical buckling load, right? And, you know, I, it's, Luke is just going to get us through this quicker because he's answering all these questions. So, because um, he knows them, make sure that, you know, you're getting it or yell it out faster than he does. Um, by the same token... What's going to happen if we if we raise the LU? Say it louder. Goes up. The what goes up? The critical buckling load will go down. Right. But I mean, it has one or the other, and so it goes down. So in other words, that means when if, if the member is longer, will is is the is it is it stronger or weaker? It's stronger. But, you know, I know this kind of, I, I have the same thing. If you know this equation and you forget that, you should be able to look at it and go, okay, if I, if I raise L, if I make it, instead of 1, I make it 2, and that's squared, so definitely my, that's going to raise my, um, wait, so if I raise my, uh, if I raise my length, it's in the denominator, it's going to lower my uh, load, right? So it makes it weaker. It's lowering the load it can take, right? So if we have a, a higher modulus of elasticity, is that going to raise or lower the strength of the of the member? Raise it. It's in the it's in the numerator. Totally makes sense. If our if our stiffness is higher, if the slope of that line is higher, it's a stronger member. But that's why it's in you know Euler's not some kind of god. He just you know he figured this out. He put them all together. Um, so by the way, this together. And maybe even Luke doesn't know this. What are those? What are those? Kt times Lu. What is that? It's called the effective length. So in the slenderness ratio equation, slenderness ratio equals effective length over the radius of gyration. Effective length. I'm not. I'm not going to probably ask you this equation, but you should understand it. Is Kt times Lu. So why is it called the effective length? It's because of this. It's saying if you combine how the end condition is affecting the member and its length, you're getting that the effective length, the actual length that is uh, we're considering and that's going to be loaded. Okay, and so it's the effective length over square root of the moment of inertia divided by area that determines its slenderness ratio. Um, and this is basically saying, well, we haven't talked about moment of inertia yet, so let's do that real quickly. That's the last one we haven't talked about. What is the moment of inertia? Anybody? Okay, let's just let's just uh, jump. Right. I'll just. I mean, because in a way, that's true, but and I should have my. I have that nice little. Um, Actually, I'll do a rectangle. I have that nice little SketchUp model that makes this so clear. Um, if I am loading this member in compression, it, it's going to have more of a tendency to buckle about one of these axes, axes than the other. That tendency to buckle is the moment of inertia. And so, right, it's going to it's going to buckle much more easily. A, along this axis then cross the other way, right? And that's because of what Luke was saying is that we actually have on this axis, we have a lot more stuff farther away from the centroid. So 
it's going to be more resistant to buckling if you have more stuff there, right? That's that's out away from that centroid. Okay, so we actually we, we've always been using just one moment of inertia, but uh, like for example, this actually has two moments of inertia, and we would always use the least moment of inertia because it's it's going to fail on the weaker, just like we're, with the symmetrical truss. So that's what. So this might be a question: Why is it then in, in structures that we tend to use symmetrical members in in trusses? Why? Because we don't, so we don't waste material. That'd be a, that'd be a, a a great way of putting it. Um, and it's, and if I went a step further, it's um, because if we don't have, yeah, you want to say something? Uh, I was going to say so the centroid stays in the middle. Well, the centroid's yeah, the, the centroid's going to be in the middle. That's where it is. Um, that's I mean, let, let's not. I, that's so. Once we have the the member, we're going to have a centroid. So. It's not, we're not changing that, um, but it's because we have, um, if we have two moment of inertias, and so if we have the moment of inertia around this axis and one around this axis, it's going to fail around the weaker one. And so all of the extra material we put in this one is going to be wasted. So actually this member is really just this member. Structurally, because all the, st the extra stuff is not going to is not going to in buckling is not going to improve its strength. So we're really just talking about this. So that's why we just go ahead and use that. So the moment of inertia is the resistance to buckling about an axis, and your trusses is only going to be one of them. So it's about it's just the resistance of the of the column to buckling or the beam to buckling. Um, every profile has a unique moment of inertia equation, and the profile what's a profile? It's cross section. Make sure you understand that. But it's not just the cross-sectional area. It's actually because, you know, we could have um, a cross-section that looks like this and one that looks like this. They both might have the same area, but they're going to have different moment of inertia equations, right? Um, so if our moment of inertia is, goes up, does our strength, does the strength of our column go up or down? Right, because it's in the it's in the numerator. Well, I should say, and, and that's also going to be in true, true in Johnson. So it, that, that, I think we can say that. Um, so then, if we come over to our slenderness ratio equation, um, I just want to say this. I'm not saying I would maybe put this in the quiz, but again, this is even this is common sense too, and you can think it through. We're saying that the effective length, which is the the length that's going to be exposed to the the force, um, and then is variable based on how, how efficiently we use that area. So if you think through square root of I over A, they both have area in them. So, and if you kind of think it through, like the we, way we, we've been doing it, a numerator denominator, um, you'll see that a higher slenderness ratio um, is weaker, and it's weaker because of the way that if, if the, um, the area is, let's say these are the same, whichever one of these uh, is more efficiently laid out in terms of being uh, far away from the, the centroid, it's going to be stronger. Um, anyway, that's why we have that equation for slenderness ratio. Um, okay, so now we have, we, we can calculate the uh, failure load. So, so this is failure load for our short fat. This is the failure load for our long thin. But we need one more equation. Does anybody have any idea why we have a third equation? Okay. I haven't done this yet, but I, I may actually just put a, a chart like this on on the, a version of the quiz because this is like our entire semester, and this is actually what your a lot of what your trust model is going to be doing is this chart. It's just doing it in an automated way, automated, automated way. So this dot right here is load at yield. And we get that by saying, and it's we know the yield strength of the material. Because this is what what what, it, what we're always in buckling, what we're always um, wrapping is the length of the member uh, over its uh, uh, failure load, its critical buckling load. In order to make this chart, we have to know what material we're talking about so we can get an E and a Y value, and we need to know uh, its 
uh, profile, right? So we can get the moment of inertia. Uh, and, we, and we need to know its area also. Once we have that, we can just plug in the cross-sectional area of the material uh, and its uh, yield strength, and we'll get that number, right? Flow to yield, correct? Then, so if, if we're saying it's short enough that it's in pure compression, we know what it fails at, or if it's in tension. Then we say, okay, but you know, what if we, we know things aren't always gonna be in, in pure compression or tension. When they get longer, we're gonna use Eulers. And, um, and so that's this curve, right? Um, but even if we were just reinventing this and we started with, we had pure compression and we had Eulers critical buckling load equation, we could look at it and go, all right, I believe that Euler was a smart guy and that's working, but at some point, that's not gonna work. Because as we get closer to zero, this is going toward infinity, and I know we cannot have an infinitely strong member. So at some point, we need another equation, right? And we need an equation that gets us from here to here, because we're saying that's in pure compression where it's gonna fail, right? So this guy Johnson comes along and goes, all right, we need to get over there, how are we gonna get there? Um, it's yield. First of all, we're, we're in, in pure compression, we're saying we're gonna use the yield because we're, you know, we're, um, well, we could, let's not even get into why, you could, you could argue that, I guess. You could, you could maybe wanna use the ultimate compressive strength. Um, but we're saying in structures that we, want, we don't wanna damage the materials so that we're gonna use yield. So then he created an equation that just points to yield. That's all it's doing, right? And that's why there's those yields in the, the Johnson equation. So if I change my yield strength All that happens is this, my flow to yield changes and then Johnson's just points it back, okay? So it's an experimentally, as far as I understand, it's an experimentally derived uh, equation to get us from Euler's to pure compression, okay? And so if we go back to our drawing, we have something else that we call, you know, a transition material or I'm sorry, um, geometry, transition, and it uses Johnson's, and if we look at Johnson's equation, um, so we were calling it JPCR equals, what is it, Y minus one over E times y over 2 pi squared times slenderness ratio all times area. I think that's right. Don't, by the way, and I can't, people are writing these things down. We, the way you want to go for, for week three is to the week three assignment. Uh, turn on your hot links, you know, your outline that says equations. Click on that. It has every equation we've used. Um, so that's where you want to go. Don't, you know, I, I may have gotten this wrong. Um, but here we go. We see, okay, we know where that's coming from. We know where that's coming from. Let me actually make this more consistent. All right, we know where that's coming from. We know where that's coming from. There's Y again. Um, we, we looked at this slenderness ratio already. It's all stuff that we know from, uh, it's the same as from the buckling equation, from Euler's critical buckling load equation, and we know the area, all right? So this is all, this is just sort of a, re, just using the same variables, um, different equation that, that's getting us to point to um, Euler's, I mean, um, point, transition from Euler's to uh, pure compression. So what then, what's this line? What's the black line in, in that chart? Critical length. It's the critical length. What is the critical length? Yeah. Yeah, it's the transition between, it's the length that's the transition between Euler and Johnson. So right at this exact point, you can either use, you can use either one, right? That equation is derived from, so think about it. So we're saying um, that this, every, all these columns have a, have a, a slenderness ratio, right? KTLU over the square root of I over A. Um, and there's a critical slenderness ratio that, that you can go read about how that was derived. But let's just assume we've got it, that equation. So slenderness ratio, the critical slenderness ratio is a slenderness ratio. And so if you, the, and, and uh, only one of them has length in it. So if you, re, if you solve for length and the slenderness ratio equals critical slenderness ratio, you get a critical length. 
And the point at where the slimness ratio is equal to the critical slimness ratio is that point. So that's where it's coming from. So what do we know, though, if, um, kind of like, the whole reason we're doing this, um, or the whole, our, our end to this is the length of the member, right? So in our truss analyzer, when we, when we have a bunch of links that we get from the Pythagorean theorem, um, and we output them, and we need to figure out what their loads are. We already know anything in tension, we know it's formula, right? What's its formula? Anything in tension? Yeah. Load over area. Load over, and, and yes, and then what's the, well, the load of, so what equals load over area? Okay, stress. Stress equals load over area. So if it's, so it's, um, we're saying that it's the yield stress that we're talking about. So yield stress equals load over area. So the load at yield would, would be stress times area, okay? The, the yield stress. Um, so that's for the tension members. But now if we have, and that's so you, you, you're coming out of the truss analyzer or anything in tension, that's what you're applying to that member to see what it's failing at. Then uh, in buckling, we can either have Euler's or Johnson's. And the way we tell the difference is that if we're, if our, uh, length of the member coming out of the truss analyzer is longer than the LUCR, then it's an Euler length and we apply the Euler equation. If it's shorter, we, we use, it's a Johnson length and we apply the Johnson equation. That's pretty much all you're doing, uh, but you just, you have to apply some kind of uh, if-then statement or whatever in Excel to make that to where it's automated. Right? Does that make sense? Is everybody getting that? Okay. Um, then the last thing really what we have to talk about, and I'll, I'll be brief with it because it's pretty, uh, it's, it's very simple and it's, it's, uh, it's a one, it's a one liner in this class is the joints. Um, but what I want to say, cause I know I've already, I've talked a long time. Now the next step out of that, and if you still don't get it, come top, top me uh, individually, but now we're saying there's three equations that we're using, uh, load yield equals, uh, uh, yield stress times area, cross-sectional area, uh, Euler's, if that's in tension, and then Euler's and Johnson's in buckling. Once you get the buckling loads, then you have to figure out which ones are failing. And that, I've already, I've, we talked about that last week. It's a relationship between the load ratio and the failing load. And then once you get that, you have to figure out what the failure load of the truss is. And once you get that, you have to figure out the strength of the weight, which is the failure load. Um, divided by uh, its uh, the weight of, of all the members, and also the joints in the experimental version of it. So if you're having trouble with that, you need to talk to me about it, because that really, you need to get these modelers done um, kind of ASAP at this point. Um, okay, so let's go back to just for one more little theory thing. If we go back to our triangle, our simple, the simplest truss that we can imagine. We said that these that these joints uh, are infinitely strong, but they have no volume. Um, in the real world, then we have to uh, we have to make sure that we make we, we build joints that are stronger than um, the members, so that they never fail. And what we presented in, I think I've got my actually I, got, I think I have this open in, yeah, great. Um, so here's the simplest uh, joint I could design to make this point. And here's the basic, the basic point is that if we're, well, let me, actually, let me start at the beginning here. So here's the truss, right? Then we have these joints that we're conceiving that we're going to make. Um, The load then it's not a, not on a member; it's on this joint. We're saying initially, and that load is actually occurring right here, right? And if we think about it, then um, what's going on is the load is coming to this point and at the point on the other side. That's the only place that, the, that this member uh, and this pin are coming in contact. That load is being uh, taken by the pin and then transferred through the centroid of the members, right? So once 
it gets to the center of the members. It's going to be in the, in the cross section normal. The, the, the load is going to be normal to the cross section, right? Like we said in tension and compression. But right here, that load is, even though it's the cross section, it's parallel to, the, to that cross section, right? That's the whole difference, and that's called shear, right? Uh, there is a, we haven't, we didn't really talk about displacement with shear. If you go look at Neil's slides, there is displacement in the same way that there is in, um, uh, um, in tension uh, or compression, you know, the, the, the delta L. But the way, and oh, by the way, let me go one step further, just to make sure you understand what I was talking about. That load, right, is on both sides of this pin, so it's actually called double shear in this case. Um, so, if we go back to the drawing, um, we're saying then that let's see, if we have that simple joint set up and we load this and then we look at it section or in, in as an axon the load then is being applied through the cross section here but the way that that, that it's it's different than you know tension and compression where you where you're then like that that's accruing on top of each other or um, you know it's basically lined up it's a very efficient way in compression and tension that the, 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 the uh, material is taking the force in this case it's essentially a sliding force or sliding response. So it's the way we've presented it in this class is it's, it's a uh, catastrophic failure. It slides across itself and breaks at that point. Okay. Or, you know, theoretically we break at both points. If it was a, um, that, that joint we were talking about, um, in the, the, the SOLIDWORKS model. But the interesting thing here and the thing that, to, you know, that, so we're the equation Right? So usually we say tau, I think. We use tau for um, shear stress. It's still load over area. It's really the same area, but I usually write parallel because it's, and this is what's interesting to me, if you, it's the same force. So we could make these members out of brass 260, the pen out of brass 260. Um, it's the same force on them, but it's being experienced in a completely different way. And so we have a different, we're going to have a completely different answer to how they, um, how they're going to fail, right? Okay. But all you're doing is just making sure that you, that you design a joint that's stronger than what you imagine to be the, the weakest uh, or, or the, 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 the highest load it's, it's going to take based on the, the, the loads that the members are taking um, is, all, is, is really as far as we're going with, with, with the joints. Okay, so I think then... So then the last thing to say, right, is that so if we come back to our crazy little truss that we, that we saw, and the only reason we went on that long journey of, to compression, tension, and shear is because this is useless without materials and without the geometry of the, uh, the cross-section of the member. But once we have those, we can bring them back or we can uh, take this information out of the truss analyzer, get actual failing loads, and predict without ever touching a material, we can just with the internet on our desert island and we somehow have a computer or maybe we just we're really good with coconuts or something and, and you know, um, we can figure all this out with ever, without ever touching anything that we would build the trusses out of. And we, we, we could predict um, what the truss is gonna fail at, what, what load it's gonna fail at, which, uh, which members are gonna fail, we could uh, predict its, its strength to weight, and then and then we could say, okay, that's my baseline. I'm going to now change this to do something I want to do. Like I actually want to, you know, I want something that's not doesn't have two parallel cords. I want it to have a, a um, be able to have a boat go underneath it. How do I do that and keep the same strength, or how do I make it stronger? That would be an investigation, for example, right? Um, and we can do that without ever touching any materials, and you know, at least at least be in the ballpark. I think as to what it's, as to what the reality would be. All right, so that's the theory. That's the, uh, let me actually, I didn't look one time at my list. Let me just look at that and see if there's anything in here. I'll just, okay, I'll read down these. E, I, K, T, L, U. I mean, yeah, you can write them down, but come on. This is all the stuff that's load ratio. That's one thing we didn't. Do you understand why I'm calling this a load ratio? 
because that's the ratio of the load that that member's taking, right? It's not a load. So, you know, this is not 106 pounds. Um, it, is, it is, if you had 100 pounds on the top uh, joint of this truss, that member would experience 106 pounds. So its load ratio is 1.06, right? Um, yield, elastic, plastic, parallel load, normal load, planar, M equals 2J minus 3, statics, load, stress, strain, tension, compression, shear, slenderness ratio, profile. Oh, what's the cut length? Yeah. Can you say it louder? Okay, or it's it's what you buy. <laughs> I mean, no, that that's that's true, and that's actually exactly that's a better de definition. What he said is the unsupported length plus the length uh, on both sides that are in, in the joint. Um, so I think that's in terms of our trust is what it is. Um, but in the real world, it's what you buy. You know, um, it's what they cut. <laughs> you know, at the factory, um, buckling, hinge, fix, strength to weight rush ratio, truss strength, ductile, brittle. Load at yield, percent elongation at fracture, Johnson's parabola, Euler's critical buckling load, shear stress, tensile stress, ultimate tensile strength. Yeah, I covered all of those. Um, and you guys were very patient. Uh, I did that for you, so hopefully it was helpful. But I know still it's not easy to sit and listen to almost an hour and a half of talking about um, a summary of trust theory. Um, so let me turn this off. And anyway, you guys can start... Uh, Working in your groups. Um, if nobody comes up to me to, to ask me,